Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, even with all of the challenges, I am excited about this new year. How many people are feeling that? Okay, about half. <laughs> The other half are like, oh my gosh, more of the same. I can't take it. You know, yes. So I understand. I understand. But whenever there is a new season, a new moment, it is an opportunity for us to be intentional as we go forward about who are we? Who are we called to be? How are we serving God? How are we listening to God? What are we doing to deepen our relationship with God and our capacity to live out his call in our lives. God teaches us to pray, deliver us. This is what he tells us. He says, pray like this, deliver us from evil. Can you all just join me in that prayer right now? Deliver us from evil, right? Deliver us from evil. We don't want evil anywhere near us. We don't want it around us. We don't want to be in bondage to it. We want to be delivered. We want to be free of it. Now, I don't know if you noticed that it doesn't say, Jesus doesn't tell them, look, pray like this, God, help me to deliver myself. Did you notice that? That it doesn't say that. It doesn't say, Pray to God, God, help me to do this myself. But wait a second. Doesn't the Bible say God helps those who help themselves? No. The Bible does not say that. That is not in the Bible, even though 52% of Christians think it is, according to a Barna poll. They think that somewhere in those 66 books of the Bible, it says God helps those who help themselves, but that is not in the Bible, and it's not scriptural. It's not even biblical in the sense that it does not comport with God's teaching, and I'm going to tell you why. Now, people have repeated it countless times over the years since it was authored by an English politician in the 1600s, and then it was repeated by Ben Franklin in Poor Richard's Almanac, and so many people do attribute it to Scripture. But God teaches the opposite. Now, we're looking at this passage where Jesus teaches them to pray, deliver us from evil. He doesn't teach them to say, God, don't worry, I got this. You know, the Lord's Prayer, God, don't worry, I got this. <laughs> that is not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer says, lead us, not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Lead me, help me get free. It doesn't say, I'm going to do my best to deliver myself so that I will be worthy of your deliverance. I mean, if I'm, if I come to you with all of my mess, I'm not going to be, that's going to be horrible. So I'm just going to, you know, fix myself up, clean myself up, do some things, make myself better, then I'll come to you. I'm going to do my very best to deliver myself so that then I can be worthy of your deliverance. But no, that is not what Jesus teaches. The problem with that statement, the idea that God helps those who help themselves, is that your first avenue of help and strength in that mode of thinking is who? You, yourself. If God helps those who help themselves, you've got to start by helping yourself. So you become your first avenue, your first source of help and strength is you in that way of thinking. And then God comes second. After you help yourself, then God will help you. That is not God's plan. Here is what God teaches. 
God helps those who ask for help. Will you repeat that with me? God helps those who ask for help. That's how we get God's help. We ask for it. We need to ask for it. We need to say, Lord, lead me. Deliver me. Why does Jesus teach us to pray like that? Lord, deliver us. Because he wants us to be delivered. He wants our freedom. He knows that God helps those who ask for help. We need deliverance. We are stuck in so many ways. We are stuck in cycles of violence and fear and ignorance and self-righteousness that go back to that very first family. I mean, that is pretty sad, right? You have Adam and Eve right there. They're given every beautiful thing. They're given all that they need to eat. They've got the garden. And then rebellion, mistrust. They're like, yeah, God doesn't really want the best for me. I'm going to do that one thing he said don't do. And then that leads to them having to leave this place of protected learning in the garden. And so they go out. Now they're out in the territory around east of Eden. And they have a baby. And Eve is so excited. The Lord has enabled me to give birth to a man, and she's got this little man. And then she gives birth to his brother. And then not even one generation has passed, and one brother gets jealous and resentful and kills the other. In just One generation, we go from willful disobedience to fratricide. And when the Lord says, where is your brother? Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? His presumed answer, no, is antithetical to the intention of God. We are called to be one another's keeper, and yet Cain's focus was his own ego. He didn't like the fact that when he brought some fruit from the garden and Abel brought the best of his flock, that God honored Abel's gift and didn't think much of Cain's gift. And so he got offended, so he told Abel, let's go out in the field. And when they were out in the field, he took Abel's life. Right before that happens, God says to Cain, if you do the right thing, your gift will be accepted. But watch out. Sin is crouching at your door. If you refuse to do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It is eager to control you, but you must overcome it. And yet Cain fails. Just a few sentences later, he takes his brother's life. This is the very first family, and this, these patterns of self-centered of taking offense, doing violence, doing harm, have continued through the generations. Greek has three words for evil, and the one that is used here is poneros. It refers to evil that causes harm. It's a word that is used to describe all of us. When he says in another passage, Jesus says, Even you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. Or God makes the rain fall on the evil and the good. This word he's using there is not the word for 
wicked to the core, kakos. It's not the word for rotten, which is sapros, but it's the word for causing harm, grievous, grief-causing. Even you who cause harm and grief to others, you know how to do some good things. And so Jesus is teaching them here, teaching us to pray, deliver us from this grief-inducing, grief-causing evil. We need deliverance. And the good news is that God provides deliverance. God is in the business of deliverance. This is what God does. This is who God is. God is the deliverer. We see that all the way back, even in the story of Cain. When God talks to Cain and obviously knows that Cain just killed his brother, he's like, there are consequences for that. And Cain is afraid that he himself is going to be murdered. And God says, you know what? I'm going to protect you. And he puts the mark of Cain. We often think of the mark of Cain as a curse. But the mark of Cain was God's protection. It was a blessing so that even someone who had fallen so far short, had done so wrong, would get God's love and care and protection, would not be murdered, even though that is what he had done to someone else. God is a God of deliverance. God delivers the people. When Moses is called to lead the people out of slavery in Egypt, God is the one that leads them through the desert with a fiery pillar by night and a cloud by day, and he leads them forward. God is in the business of deliverance. Now, we heard today what Jesus said to the disciples. He called his 12 disciples together, and he gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and heal every kind of disease. Jesus gave the disciples authority. He wants you to be bold. He wants you to be equipped. He wants you to be able to handle business, to take care of what needs to be taken care of, to set boundaries when that is what needs to be done, to speak up when that's what needs to be done. He wants you to be equipped to help break the chains that bind the minds and the hearts and the lives of his people. He gave them authority. He gave them authority and sent them out. I want you to notice something here. He gave. He gave them authority. Our authority comes from God in Christ. Our authority comes from following God. Our authority comes from being under Christ's authority. Authority is not given to those who claim it. Yep, I'm in charge here. Y'all do what I say. How many of you have tried that in your household? How does it work? <laughs> once in a while, once in a while, right? It'll work. <laughs> <laughs> but we are talking about an authority that is granted in our spirits that comes to us because we are under Christ's authority and we are going where Christ is leading. Authority is given to those who are in the will of God, who are obedient and following where God is leading. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. He gave them authority. Some people think if I surrender to God's authority, I'll be milk toast. I mean, I'll be a doormat. I'll have to be nice to everyone, you know. I'll just be like, okay, God is God, but I'm just me, so I'll never be able to speak my truth and speak up because that wouldn't be nice. 
Being under God's authority does not mean that you are always nice. Sometimes you have to say something difficult. Sometimes you have to speak the truth, and it's not something that someone wants to hear. But as it says in Ephesians, God doesn't want us to be babes tossed back and forth by whatever anybody else says. He calls us to speak the truth in love. And that way, it says in Ephesians, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. So we can surrender to God and actually be empowered to speak the truth in love. Some people think, I don't want to surrender to God because I'll lose my edge. I mean, my spiritual practice is so profound. My fasting is so complete. My meditation is so deep. You know, I've got the edge. And if I surrender to God, then it's, well, it's all God. It's not, it's not me, and I'm doing so much. Jesus describes the dangers of spiritual practice without surrender in Matthew and in Luke when he addresses the Pharisees. And he says, when an unclean spirit comes out of a person, it passes through arid places seeking rest. And when it doesn't find it, it says, I'll return to the house I left. And on its return, it finds the house swept clean, put in order. And then it goes and brings seven other spirits just as wicked as itself, and they go in and dwell there. And the final plight of that man is worse than the first. And this is how spiritual, people who are spiritual but not surrendered to God can cause even more damage. And we've seen that in the crimes within the church. God gives us authority, but that authority comes under God's authority, comes through surrender to God. Sometimes we don't want to surrender to God because I think if I surrender to God, if I don't hold that person accountable, they're never going to learn. They're going to keep on doing whatever it was. My anger is important I'm going to show them. And that's what Cain did. He's like, come on out in the field with me. Don't think you can one-up me with your gift. I'm taking you out. Now, we might not murder somebody, but we can gossip behind their back. We can take them down. We can undermine their authority. We can speak about them in ways that pull them down. And yet, if we... Look at the scripture. God says, vengeance is mine. God has a plan and a purpose for bringing about justice on the world, bringing awareness and transformation. I don't have to do it myself. We are called to work collectively. And if our systems need reform and you realize that you're not going to get the justice that you need if you surrender to God's authority, perhaps your calling is to bring God's word and purposes into the systems that we have set up right now. Don't take a desire for vengeance into your own hands. We are called to surrender to God. Our deliverance and the authority that God gives us comes from surrender. Finally, we might not want to surrender because I might think, you know what, if I surrender, I'll be lazy. I'll just put everything on God. It's like, well, I can't really do everything. It's in God's hands. I mean, you know, God is going to do it. I'll just wait and see what God does. Consider the passage where Jesus teaches them to ask and seek and knock. I like what Bible scholar Clarence Hayes says about this. Asking is seeking God's help and direction for the answer. But then seeking and knocking are putting your faith and your feet 
into action. When you knock, you're going up and you are doing something. You're taking action. God will help you with boldness to say what needs to be said, to proclaim the gospel, to speak the truth in love. But you have to open your mouth. God will help you find a job that you love, but you have to look, you have to talk to people, you have to do the work. God will help you improve your relationship with your spouse, with your children, but you have to commit to spending time with them. God will help you pass the test, but you have to study. In other words, God's authority does not remove your responsibility but it does make your effort fruitful when you move according to God's direction. Now, there's one place where your effort is immaterial, and that's in regard to your salvation. Each of us has our salvation accomplished fully in Christ. But even then, we need to accept it. We need to open our mouths and say, yes, we need to repent for our self-centered ways and say, God, I am tired of that. I am not continuing in that way. I want to follow you. If I surrender to God's authority, God will give me the authority I need. God will give me the favor I need. God will give me the direction I need. God will give me the wisdom I need. God will give me the peace I need. God will give me the power I need. God will give me the resources I need to do what God wants me to do. And those resources may come from unexpected areas. It was funny, I met with a wonderful member of our wider community who is Jewish the other day because he's helping to fund one of the positions at the Village Hub. And he said, you Christians really need us Jews to help fund your good work. God will give you the help you need. You don't know where it's going to come from. God will give you deliverance. God will give you support. If you need a therapist, let God direct you to the right therapist. If you need a coach, if you need a healer, let God tell you, is this the right healer for you? If you're looking for a spiritual community, pray. Where does God want you? If you're wondering if you should stay at your job, pray. Where is God calling you to be? Don't make your decisions based on your likes and dislikes, based on your feeling in the moment. Choose God's calling over your comfort. Choose God's direction over your desire. Choose God's will over what you want. Our wills and our wants, our desires and our feelings go up and down. God's will is something that we can stand on and build our lives on. He is a rock. So don't start trying to deliver yourself. Start by getting under God's authority. Who are you praising? Who are you looking to for answers? Are you putting God first in your life? Are you looking for God's direction? If I surrender to God, God will deliver me. This is God's promise. Jesus says, pray, deliver us from evil. God is in the deliverance business. Evil is not too much for God. Satan cannot overpower me because I am not trying to save myself. I am surrendering to God's authority and then seeking and standing in God's deliverance. May it be so. Amen.
Amen. Let us continue together in worship. Let us join together in singing authority. Actually, let's sing I Surrender. Let's sing I Surrender. Yeah, good. joining together in song. Take this moment and with this song to just recommit your life to God, to giving your life to God, to seeking God's deliverance. To asking for God's leadership. To pouring out your heart. To loving God. To worshiping God. We are here to worship. We are here to surrender. We are under God's authority. Down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Oh, find me here, Lord, as you draw me. I'm desperate for you. Desperate for you, I surrender. Drench my soul is mercy and grace. Unfold a hunger and thirst. A hunger and thirst. On the night that Jesus was stressed, why I know you hear my cry. Speak to me now. Speak to me now. Saying, take and eat. This is my body given I for you. Surrender. I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. Likewise, at the end of the I meal, surrender. You took the From Jesus, you more. I want to know you more. And he said, This is the cup of the like new covenant poured out for you. And Jesus, breathe the Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. Like a mighty storm stirring in my soul, Lord, have your way, have your way. Creator God, feed in our bodies, me. feed our minds, feed our spirits. Move in our hearts I and minds surrender. and bodies and spirits as we surrender, as we say I yes to you. Surrender. Pour yourself, pour your fresh wine into I our bloodstream. Pour you yourself, your more. wisdom into our bones. Help us receive this more. feast I in your spirit as we surrender. I surrender. As we say yes to you, as we say yes. I want to know to you, you more. I want to know you more. Amen. 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 Woohoo! Thank you, 
you, Jesus. Amen. We have an opportunity every time that we gather to give to God some of that which God has given to us. God invites us, calls us, challenges us to give a tithe of whatever we receive, to give it away freely, generously. And I pray that some of how God is moving in your heart is leading you to give some of that tithe and offering right here at Woodside Village Church. We have a number of people I know. uh, Kathy is going to come around, and if there's one more um, person, perhaps he'll help her to bring a basket around. You can also give online. There's the QR code in our program as we join together in worship with our offering. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army. Rising up, make your offering an act of worship. Break every chain, 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 break every chain. Amen. Creator God, thank you so much that you are breaking every chain, that you are helping us to know who we are under your authority. God, I ask that you would move in the hearts and minds of everyone who's here. God, each person who is here, that whatever ways that each of us who is gathered here is feeling blocked or stuck or in bondage in any way, that you would bring breakthrough, God, as we as we enter this new year, as we go into this first new moon coming up at the end of this week that you would enable us as we enter into prayer and fasting together, each of us in our own way, according to how you call us and how you move in our lives, that you would bring breakthrough, God. We are trusting you that you have said, pray for deliverance. So we are praying for deliverance and we are trusting you that you will bring it about in your precious name with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. I want to invite anybody who would like to come up for communion. I'm going to um, I'm going to put on my my mask and I will serve for those who would like to come up as Tammy plays the um, the song here I am to worship. You're welcome to stay where you are and sing. You are welcome to receive this benediction and and to go and get coffee, but just if you would uh, let this space continue to be a worshipful space um, until everyone who has had communion um, has received it. And so now, in the name of the creator of all life, of the holy Lord Jesus, and of the Holy Spirit, go forth knowing that God has equipped you to build the plane while flying, to forgive while being hurt, to speak out where you need to, to surrender to God and hear from God's direction. You are blessed. You are equipped. You are ready for deliverance and freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
light of the world you step down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Oh, I'll never know how much 
much it cost to see my sins upon that cross. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together worthy, all together wonderful to me, to me, to me, to me. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who came here, to everyone who braved the challenges. Thank you to everyone, all to our wonderful musicians, Tammy and Nick. Thank you to all of our incredible sound and AV team and helpers. Thank you so much. If you are hearing the sound of my voice, can we just join in a prayer and praise for God for all of them with thanksgiving and a hand clap. Amen.